Echo, welcome to the Center on Public Diplomacy. And thank you so much for joining us. And I'd like to turn the program over to you for your presentation. Thank you so much, Jay. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure uh, to be with you from London here uh, today. Look, I'm going to talk for a while, then I'm going to be in conversation with Josh. Um, and I guess, look, just to start, I started thinking about this idea of the Black Fantastic, uh, I suppose a few years ago, when I was looking at the work of a number of different artists, visual artists primarily, Kara Walker, Wangechi Mutu, Nick Cave, Chris Afili, and I started to notice a thread that bound some of their work together. I was interested looking at their work and how uh, uh, black artists like themselves and artists from across the African diaspora were embracing myth and speculative fiction in their work and doing so as a way to address racial injustice. And I guess I want to break that down a little bit as I talk right now. Um, but it's also to say that as well as visual art, I was struck by how I was seeing a shared tendency in play in other areas, in music, in literature, uh, in film. So in those respects, we could talk about, well, anything from Beyonce's Lemonade to Brian Coogler's Black Panther to the work of Octavia Butler, which a couple of years ago ended up in um, in New York Times uh, bestseller list for the first time in, well, many years since, since some of her novels were published. And in all of these ways, I was reflecting on the ways that black culture was becoming what seemed to me becoming uh, fantastically ambitious and imaginative, stretching out beyond realism. And I suppose one of the touch points here is that I can think back, I can think back to previous years of, of black visual culture and black popular culture, where notions of the real and the authentic were the touchstones of artistic integrity, of artistic ambition. We think about hip hop and we think about invocations to keep it real, to stay true and apparently authentic. And here we're in a different mode, a different moment. And I was interested in why that was. I was interested in why in visual art and in popular culture more broadly, Black artists seem to be embracing the fantastic, the strange, the fabulous and the mythic. At the heart of this, it seemed to me that black artists were grappling or continue to grapple with race as a dual condition race as a socially constructed fiction, and also race as a scientific truth, sorry, race as a socially constructed fiction, race as a scientific fiction, but also race as a lived reality, race as a, a framework that structures most of our lives. I want to think for a moment about the historical roots of that, because one of the outcomes of racialized thinking, one of the outcomes of living within a world, within our everyday world, where we take race as a given, irrespective of its fictional status, one of the outcomes of that is the Black people end up, by and large, being othered, 
in Western society. They end up being constructed as alien and strange and illegitimate in terms of their personhood or their humanity. We can look back to the roots of this. When we look back to the Enlightenment, we go to the 18th century, we go to the work of key figures who are thinking through really the foundations of modern Western society. Figures like Hegel, like Kant, like uh, in the US founding fathers like Jefferson. Figures whose work and whose ideas become foundational to how the West constructs itself as a society built on values of progress and tolerance, democracy, openness. These same figures are simultaneously looking at people of African origin and demarcating them as other and lesser. Hegel talks about African people as being representative of what he calls natural man in his completely wild and untamed state. Kant dismisses black people. He talks about, the, he says the Negro can be disciplined and cultivated, but is never genuinely civilized. These are the same figures whose work underpins our modern society. Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson, at the same time as writing that all men are created equal, was writing in detail about the differences as he saw them between black people and white people, differences in appearance, but also differences in character, differences in sentiment, differences in sensibility, differences in capacity to think. In all of these ways, Jefferson insisted that black people were lesser to white people, even as he wrote that all men are created equal. In the 19th century, scientific racism tries to codify distinctions between white and black, invents a pseudoscience around craniology, around these apparent physical markers of, of difference that confine black people to a lesser status. Many of these tropes, I would suggest, remain with us to this day. Many of these ways of imagining Black people as lesser, as brute, as animal, as lascivious, as somehow less sophisticated. We can think of these when we think about constructions of Africa, for instance, in the popular imaginary, as a place somehow that continues to live outside history or beyond history or before history more precisely, as a place somehow that looks outside modernity, outside the flow of progress. And we can date some of that thinking back to the Enlightenment. The question then becomes, what do Black people do? What do we do? How do we live under conditions where our being, our personhood, our humanity is challenged, is denied, is caricatured. This is territory that W.E.B. E. Du Bois was thinking through. In 1903, Du Bois, the great sociologist and analyst of race, coins the term double consciousness to describe what he, what he talks about of as the, well, the dual condition of being Black in America, which is to live both within, both physically within and psychologically outside a society, to understand that even as you are within that society, it looks at, at you with contempt and loathing. Du Bois defined that condition as double consciousness. Ralph Ellison in the landmark Invisible Man brought that to life through fiction, 
Ralph Ellison talked about the Invisible Man. The Invisible Protagonist in the Invisible Man is a, is a character who realizes that he is invisible to the white gaze. He cannot be seen by white people. And more properly, they choose not to see him. They look past him. They regard him as beneath perception. He becomes invisible. When Ellison wrote his book, readers were slightly confused. They wondered whether it was based on reality of some kind. Ellison insisted that uh, it was a work that the basis of it was not the issue, that it was a work, as he described it, of dilated fiction, a work, in other words, that took what was real in some respects and stretched it and thought it through and extended it beyond fact into a fictive realm. Toni Morrison does something similar. Uh, writing Beloved, Toni Morrison talks about how she took elements from real life, from the experiences of Black people during slavery, to create a novel that was historically true in essence, but not strictly factual. Here we start to see the Black fantastic come into visibility as a terrain, as an idea that it conjoins both lived reality and the experience of Black people who live within a fiction and a fantasy that is beyond their control, who live within a system that sees them as strange, as discrepant, as other, as alien, as not fully human. What do we do then? How do we live then? One answer is to live within, is to conjure the Black fantastic as a terrain. This is what I suggest artists and writers and filmmakers and musicians have been doing. They have been reaching towards myth. They have been reaching towards fable. They've been reaching towards the fantastic. Crucially, not as a way to answer those fictions imposed upon them, but as a way to reach beyond, to look beyond, to look beyond the racialized everyday and conjure other ways of seeing, to offer other ways of being. We can look to a couple of examples. We can look to the work of the artist Wangechi Mutu, or indeed Lena Iris Victor, artists who draw on these fantastic imaginaries and images. Or we can look to the work of Ellen Gallagher with her series of paintings, Ecstatic Draft of Fishes. So these are paintings which draw their inspiration from the ocean bottom, from the depths of the ocean. Ellen Gallagher's Ecstatic Draft of Fishes, we can see when we look, the background is made up of the detritus of the ocean floor of shells and of corals and of fallen matter. But here we see a fictive realm come into play. Ellen Gallagher is thinking about a number of things simultaneously here. She's thinking about the legacies of the Middle Passage, the forced transportation of African people across the ocean during slavery to the Americas and the Caribbean. She's also thinking about a contemporary myth that's constructed in the 1990s by the Detroit techno group Drexia. Drexia fashion and contemporary myth based again on reality. Drexia the group talk about how uh, African people were cast overboard from slave ships during the era of slavery, true events, but they construct a, 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 a fiction that suggests that pregnant women thrown overboard, the fetuses within pregnant women who are thrown overboard learned to breathe in the water and went on then to construct their own society beneath the water, an aquatopia 
called Draxia, where black people who live underwater live free beyond the reaches, beyond the depredations of slavery or colonialism. And then Gallagher, with the ecstatic draft of fishes series, constructs a vision of this. Here we see something of what the inhabitants of Drexia might look like. Her figures are based on, on sculpted fang figurines from the kind of fang society of Central Africa. So we have a Drexia that's based on African people, but also African art and creativity that constructs a set of African possibility. Here we have not a, an escape or a repost to the racialized everyday, but another realm entirely. One more example we can look to. We can look to the work of Nick Cave. Uh, Nick Cave's extraordinary sound suits. So in the 1990s, Nick Cave is an artist, Chicago-based artist, he's watching TV, and he sees footage of the motorist, Rodney King, being savagely beaten by the Los Angeles police force. Being savagely beaten and then being described by that same police force as an animal, a beast-like, hulk-like, out of control. The LAPD beat Rodney King, but insist they act in self-defense, insist that Rodney King himself is the aggressor. Nick Cave is so distressed by the experience of watching this that he starts to make the first of his sound suits. He makes a suit that covers the entire body, a suit that is made of sequins and patterns and colors. And he's gone on to make over 500 of these sound suits, each one of them different, each one of them gorgeous and colored and patterned. Uh, in all sorts of extraordinary ways. Some sound suits made for movement, made for dancing, sound suits made to re receive, to play, to display. The crucial thing about the sound suits is you put one on and they're all made for wearing. One's racial identity disappears. You become a person without uh, an immediately apparent race or sex or gender, you become free of some of these social constraints, some of these constraints of being looked at. One becomes free to express oneself. And here then we see a reformulation of blackness as a site of beauty and possibility and self-fashioning, a way of being that is not determined by being looked at by society, but is determined solely by how one wants to hold oneself, fashion oneself, move through the world with beauty, with possibility, with wonder, with delight, with the capacity to embrace beauty, to own and honor possibility, to make of oneself what one chooses to do. And surely this, is the epitome of freedom, of possibility, this capacity to fashion oneself, to honor one's own dream, one's own dreams. Nick Cave reaches to masquerade, to African patterns of masquerade, to carnival, to uh, 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 ways of processing and being and costume that run deep through African diasporic culture and society. He reaches to history, to possibility, to myth. And through that, he finds a way to assert black self, black being, black possibility in the moment. This, I'd suggest, is what the black fantastic can look like. Thank you. Hi, Echo. Thank you so much. That's okay, Josh. It's a pleasure to see you. Pleasure to see you. Thank you for that. Um, just a little sample.
that little little glimpse into um, what is, of course, a a, a very deep genealogy um, that you put together, both in in, in exhibition form um, and in in the companion uh, book and catalog. Equally extraordinary and equally deep. Um, I, I should preface this conversation um, with with um, you know the inevitable kind of. Um, uh, admission that I was unable to see the exhibition when it was up um, at, the, at the Hayward Gallery. Um, but but I have spent a lot of time with the book. So, um, uh, you know, all my comments are, are feeding off the from, book. From LA, that is okay. That's okay, right? Okay, yeah. all right. Um, so I, I wanted to, um, I, I want to come back to some of the themes that, that actually just popped up a bit in your comments. But I wanted to start, um, with with the, the kind of question of the middle passage because in the in 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 the book itself in the in the book's narrative um the middle passage but specifically um jmw turner's representation of the middle passage in an 1840 painting kind of begins the narrative in a certain way and obviously this is a recurring with with uh, you know uh, you know very good reason or uh, kind of recurring um and defining historical moment for what you're writing about. But I guess I wanted to ask a different question, which is, um, is there a black fantastic before the transatlantic slave trade? That's, I mean, that, that, that's a really good question. I mean, yes, to the extent that there are much African beliefs, many African belief systems are based on, well, uh, invocations of deities and uh, belief systems that give the natural world a kind of, uh, I'm trying to find, it's, it's interesting because I'm trying to find the words that are not supernatural yeah. and to do with, to understand, I suppose, the natural world as a living site, as a site of possibility and of dreaming. There absolutely are in those respects. And what's interesting is that uh, I mentioned before, artists like Angechi Muti, for instance, and others have explicitly drawn on that in their own, in her own work. Um, but there are, uh, so yes, there is, I guess what I was interested in with the book and the show, I was interested in the reason why I started with Turner is because I was also interested in the grappling with the West that takes place as a diasporic experience. So in as much as there are all sorts of uh, ways of being and belief systems in Africa. It's less the, I was, I'm less interested in trying to find a quote unquote authentic version of these. I'm more interested in what happens when things become complicated and crossed over, when one way of seeing has to meet another way of seeing and one construction of the world has to meet another construction of the world and what happens then and what happens in terms of having to then become more agile and more syncretic in terms of how one chooses to construct an understanding of the world as a route to progress through this other strange new territory. Yeah, no, that's it was really interesting. I mean, I, I think I'm I'm part of what I, I've been thinking about in spending time with 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 the book and with your arguments about these works is, you know, not not only the kind of structuring nature of that middle passage um experience as an experience both of that that is, you know, that 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 partly defines modernity in the West um and defines it through an act of extreme collective violence. Um, and then when you talk, when you were talking about the, the sound suits um, and their connection to uh, Rodney King, uh, I, of course, am, I'm also thinking about what um, in the U.S. Um, over the past um, over the past few days, um, you know, we are thinking now um, of yet another 
um, another person, another name, um, the name of uh, Tyree Nichols, um, who was also beaten, um, in this case, beaten to his death. And, you know, you, for example, write about in the book, you quote Wallace Best, um, who says that a black body in motion is never without consequence. Um, I'm wondering if you could say more about the relationship between the black fantastic and and violence, um, and kind of what what what's the role of um, of anti-black violence um, within the aesthetic cosmology of the black fantastic? It's, it's a really it's a really good question. I think you start before violence, and you have to prompt me if I lose track of that part of it because I want to come back to that. But I think the 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 place I want to start is thinking about this experience of being in motion. To some extent, I'd suggest the diasporic condition is of necessity a condition of being in motion, in that the roots of Black presence in the West lie with forced transportation, lie with the Middle Passage. From then on, there's always a question about where exactly is home? Where exactly is a point of origin? And even if, you know, in my case, my family is from Ghana, West Africa, I can tie my roots back there uh, very straightforwardly. Nevertheless, growing up in London, I still have these questions about where do I belong? The truth is, in more than one place, in my respect, that would be Britain and Ghana. But I would say the diasporic condition is always a hybrid condition. It's always a condition of belonging to more than one place. That throws up all kinds of, I guess, psychologies, that all kinds of senses of displacement as well as possibility. I mean, just, there's a book that I turn to here, uh, 18th century biography by, uh, by Oluwajo Equiano, The Interesting Narrative of Gustavus Fassa, uh, also known as uh, Oluwajo Equiano. It's the first slave narrative uh, that's published that deals explicitly with the Middle Passage. Equiano grows up in Nigeria, and when he's about nine, he's kidnapped, he's brought to the coast of Nigeria, he's put on a slave ship, and for the first time in print, he discusses in vivid detail the experience of being on the ship, this nightmarish experience, he thinks he's going to be eaten, uh, he doesn't know what's going on, but just the, the, the chaos and the inherent violence and and degradation, the squalor of being on the slave ship. Equiano has a long life after that. He uh, secures his freedom in his 20s. He lives in London. He travels just, in fact, travels almost everywhere. He ends up in the North Pole at one point. He's in the Caribbean. He's everywhere except Africa, in fact. It's across Europe. All the time, his condition remains one of uncertainty. Although he's free, he's never entirely free. He's always looking over his shoulder because when he's in the Caribbean or the Americas, he fears being kidnapped again. He writes later as an abolitionist, but the sense of, of being alienated, being physically alienated from a home he can barely remember, stays with him all the way through, as does his consciousness of remaining some form of outsider in a society, even though he becomes a successful author later in his life. I would say Equiano is almost an archetypal figure of the diaspora, even though we look back to the 18th century in that respect. Lickham is a figure that is always on the move, is often voluntarily on the move, but is so because 
he cannot quite determine which place he can call home because although he can lay claim to more than one place none of them is ultimately satisfactory so if this is the diasporic condition one of the things that it exposes you to is being abroad in a world in which you are not at home or deemed to belong entirely or fully the American experience, you know, we can go through it in as much as we want. Jim Crow, Sunset Towns, all of these different ways that on a local everyday level, through to the present day, black people are surveilled, confined, constrained. Even as these questions of home and belonging remain almost core to the nature of being black in the west so on one level there's a potentially existential nature to that on another level there's also a level of physical or psychological or emotional threat or violence that remains on an everyday level i'm sitting here in london but i cannot say with any certainty that on any given day i will get through that day without in some form or other some smaller glance in the way or something sometimes more pronounced than that someone will assert some sort of challenge to my right to be my right to belong my right to walk down the street this happens this is the undertow with which we live violence when it breaks out is terrifying is horrifying the psychic violence i think is the current that runs through our lives and so it's always there as part of the condition of diasporic being the the psychic violence of of the alienation that that you just described um you know, obviously is very much at work in, in one of the works that you mentioned in your opening remarks um, in Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man, um, with that, that, again, kind of archetypal subterranean um, figure who is psychically alienated, but also chooses to, to live, to kind of um, uh, opt in to alienation as a form of power and resistance. And one of the things he does, of course, famously in that, in that basement home that he makes for himself is he dreams of having multiple turntables yeah. um, where, where, where he can play uh, Louis Armstrong's uh, version of what did I do to be so black and blue on multiple turntables as if he was uh, predicting hip hop, uh, as if he was predicting the age of turntablism and turntable experiments. And this leads me to something I really wanted, I'm excited to talk to you about, which is um, the role of, of musical performance of music technologies and the black fantastic obviously in the in the exhibition and in the book there's a um a, a really important focus on visual arts um but i'm, I'm just curious you know you've meant you already mentioned detroit techno and drexia um uh, and there's so many other um musical moments that peek through in the book the album covers i'm even spying the max roach we insist um, yeah. album you know behind you on the shelf um, i'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about the role of music um in in uh you know is it a different register is it a different version of the black fantastic and it, and if so um kind of how and why yeah i mean well i mean he, look he, here's the thing the uh, the way art works in general this i'm opening myself to sweeping generalities here but let's 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 go with it for a moment so one of the things about art I would say of all kinds, from visual art through to music, is that these forms uh, privilege themselves beyond the literal, beyond the linear. They offer ways to see, to tell stories, to be, that don't have to spell out a literal construction of understanding one of the things so with music you feel music 
you can listen to it and follow its lyrics but really fundamentally you're also feeling what it is and one of the consequences of that is that I would suggest it's allowed all sorts of black people again whose presence in other forms of society or culture might be challenged it's given them the space and the freedom to imagine to dream to articulate so we can I mean, let's, you know, let's just take a few, Wu-Tang, we can go to Wu-Tang Clan for a moment. I remember, I remember, um, so I, I used to, I used to spend a lot of time writing about music earlier on in my career. And I remember going to uh, New York in the early 90s to interview the Wu-Tang Clan. Um, it's all very exciting. And I was so struck by this, by the duality of who they were. They represent as these figures who are, you know, kind of brute and masculine to some extent. This is kind of the effect that they offer. At the same time as that, we understand them as wildly imaginative figures who constructed their own kind of imaginative, you know, you'd call it now a Wu-Tang verse if you wanted to, but that's, you know, that's what, that's what they managed to do. And one of the things about talking to hip hop artists, I used to talk to a lot of them, I was very struck by them as artists. Often, again, the demeanor, the effect is hyper masculine, but actually what are they? They're poets, they're writers, they're figures who imagine from nothing, who create worlds and ways of seeing within their heads. Often there's a kind of injunction for that to be allied to some notion of authenticity. But you can look e again, even at the artist whose work apparently is based in reality and here, again, just to maintain the 90s reference. If you think about someone like Nas, or you think about someone like Mob Deep, let's say Mob Deep, for instance, so Mob Deep, the whole thing about Mob Deep, there was supposed to be about Queensbridge and out of the streets, but you listen to the music, it's intensely gothic. It's full of these strange sounds. It's got this strange kind of mournful timbre to it. It reaches, in other words, beyond reality, beyond the everyday. I would form a link from those kind of hip hop artists, in fact, to, and this is one of the sort of leap motifs that I was thinking about, or one of the figures I was thinking about all the way through uh, working on the Black Fantastic as an idea, Alice Coltrane. Because Alice Coltrane's work, and we think about her trajectory from, you know, being with John Coltrane, from playing the harp, to embracing Buddhism, to having her own ashram, the music ostensibly goes from secular to divine, although you can't really determine that much difference between those states of being. But the point is, she also then talks about, she also talks with utter sincerity about the visions she experiences. She potentially sits within a lineage of African-American visionary figures, Sojourner Truth and other figures who see beyond the everyday. All of these are tied up with the music and I remember when I was when I started working on this I was trying to think about Alice Coltrane and I was thinking about well look how do you how do you engage with a figure like her who on one level seems to have chosen to kind of abstract herself from quotidian discourse she speaks in elevated terms and I realized actually, look, this is the truth. This is the truth, this is the construction, this is the way of seeing that she has built and that offers room for others too, to imagine themselves, to conjure themselves. She's found a route to uh, a form of artistic freedom, which potentially becomes a form of cultural or social freedom for others. She's asserted the right and the liberty to reach beyond, to dream, to imagine anew. And in those respects, her music becomes incredibly generative, incredibly resonant. 
both before and after she you know, converts and opens her ashram and so on. In both states, you see the same thing happening, which is this reaching upward almost. It's reaching outward. And I guess, yes, music, Alice Coltrane, Wu-Tang, Mob Deep, to some extent, I see something similar in play with all of these, which is a capacity to dream aloud and to have that literally played out auditorily uh, as an environment which you can then occupy, you, which you can live within. Yeah, I, I, I'm not going to I'm not going to ask you to answer this, but I'm just going to mention it because we're, we're short on time and we got some questions coming in. But I'm really glad you mentioned Alice Coltrane, particularly because I've been thinking a lot about the Black Fantastic, um, not only as a kind of global um, aesthetic or, a, you know, a, a kind of um, uh, international idea, but but really site specific. Right. And, and, and place specific. And I'm thinking about Los Angeles and Southern California just because that's what happens, you know, you live here in LA and we just think we're the world. Uh, echo. Um, and, you know, obviously that, that, that ashram was, was, was out here in Southern California. It was out in the Valley. Um, but, you know, Coltrane is part of this long, longer tradition in Los Angeles and includes her nephew, Flying Lotus, um, you know, artists like Kamasi Washington and, and SZA and, um, uh, you know, visual artists like Lauren Halsey, or even go back to Lakeside Funk and the Fantastic Voyage, which I was yeah. thinking about. Um, but there's such a rich tradition that 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 individual places really connect with with all with so many things that you're talking about. Um, I just think it's so so rich. Um, so actually, let me let me dive into question to some of the questions, and one of them is about maybe gets to that is uh, actually a question from uh, a student uh, in my class. Um, big shout out to the Sound Clash. Uh, folks who are watching. Um, and, and one of the questions was, um, if you could talk about the curation process, um, because there is so much to choose from here and to think about, um, how did you design the exhibition to show and teach viewers about the Black Fantastic? Yeah, well, I mean, two things really. So uh, there's the book and the exhibition. And in a way that I was obviously working on both of those at the same time, with the exhibition, we took a decision very early on. That, so the, the exhibition opened in the Hayward Gallery in London, which is a really interesting and quite idiosyncratic space. It's a brutalist, modernist building, raw concrete building designed in the 1950s in a kind of burst of sort of utopian modernism in Britain after the war. It's designed as a non-linear space it's very hard you could, it's very hard to, to determine a single way route through it because it's not designed that way it doubles back on itself you go upstairs you go downstairs all sorts of things and as a consequence it's famously fiendishly difficult to present work inside because there is no you have to rethink uh the presentation works almost from show to show so we spent about a year working on thinking about how to present works. But the crucial thing really was that with the show, we, we only had, we chose to have just 11 artists in the show. Because in an alternative version, you could have filled the space with hundreds of individual works. I chose to do something different, which is to focus on a very limited number of artists and to present their works in a greater amount of depth, to present uh, in each case, we gave each person their own space, their own sphere, their own iteration or interpretation of the Black Fantastic. And in that respect, we're able to show uh, still images and moving images and sculptural works. We're able, in a way, to present 11 different propositions about the Black Fantastic. So a lot of the curation of the show uh, hinged exactly on that decision because after that it meant we could go deeper in individual artists and think through about how to create these different environments and these different propositions from artist to artist with the book and we're seeing images from the book here now uh the 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 i guess it was the exact opposite of that so the book is whatever it's 300 pages or whatever or something like that and I had the room to go much broader because we're not physically constrained. So with the book, I did exactly the opposite. 
what we did in the show with the book there's a lot of visual art but also i wanted to bring in all the other references from uh graphic design architecture music film all of these other areas that you know really physically have no space in the exhibition and i wanted to then have them as complementary to each other so with the exhibition it's as it were narrow and deep with the book it runs super broad and there was a del deliberate balance between those two yeah well and what a and what a gift and a, a joy to be able to have those those two different spaces yeah. right to completely explore the project in different ways it's wonderful um here's another question um uh from an audience member online it's a two-part question uh it's a it's a we've got three paragraphs to it. So I'm going to read it right, to you. Get, get your pen, get your pen. Um, um, the question begins, uh, I, I love how sci-fi and fantasy create a space for imagining different worlds and ways of engaging. Activists mm -hmm. have engaged in this work via Octavia's Brood to tell visionary, imaginative, imaginative fantasy stories. How can we encourage increased space for this type of storytelling, art, creativity, and ways of thinking in society in the context of exploring a better future. So that's question one. Hmm. Question two, additionally, white creators have often recreated oppressive systems within their sci-fi and fantasy. Avatars, white savior narratives, uh, uh, JK Rowling. Why, what do we do about that? Hmm. I think with both of them, maybe let me try answering both simultaneously, which is to say, uh, uh, so I've, I've talked about, I've talked about the Black Fantastic as a way of seeing. I've said it's kind of distinct to uh, uh, movements or tendencies like Afrofuturism. And the reason I call it that is because I wanted to highlight the way that Black cultural figures from across all these different disciplines and the ways that we were talking about have been doing something which I think is similar, which is this act of looking beyond, this act of imagining anew, this act of reaching and asserting their right to imagine, asserting their right to the fantastic. Part of one of the consequences I would suggest of that way of see is that it starts to illuminate the constructive nature of the everyday, the constructive nature of race. For me, so this is, in answer to this question, one of the ways that we both understand and critique and encourage white creators to do more, one of the ways that we think about how to construct a better future is to understand or to acknowledge the strangeness and the fallacy of the everyday race won't go away it's how we understand the world nevertheless the part that we need i would suggest to continue to critique is the notion of racial difference, the notion of somehow there being some sort of physical or biological distinction between people of different colours. And with that uh, value system and a hierarchy based around notions of progress and intelligence, sophistication, culture, all of these things which inevitably put whiteness at the top. One doesn't have to be against white people to be against the notion of whiteness with its inbuilt ideas, both of whiteness as norm, both of whiteness as superior. We critique that. We critique that through works that assert black dreaming and black possibility, works that critique the everyday and expose it for a fantasy, expose it for an ideology, and then that offer us other ways of seeing that are based on richness, imagination, 
and possibility rather than the continue as that question was mentioned rather than the continued construction of a fallacious hierarchy absolutely um two questions hover around uh this same theme so i'll try to summarize them in in into one or actually i'll just use the, the most recent of the two because um i think it speaks to it really well um there, there, there's an interest with, with with a lot of the folks who are watching about the role of africa um and particularly about um what role africa can play um in in the contemporary moment um, as a kind of remedy, if you will, for the disdain and degradation that um, you were talking about. So I'll read, I'll read one, one of the questions. Uh, many artists born in the US, UK, or other colonial headquarters are repatriating to the continent of Africa um, in search of sanctuary, rebirth, or reconnection. How does this fit within the story of creating the Black Fantastic? Again, that's interesting. I mean, you know, it's interesting. I, like I said, my family's from Ghana. I go back, I was there when it was last summer. I'm going to be there in a few months' time. Ghana is going through at the moment an art boom. There's a number of visual artists coming out from Ghana doing extraordinarily well internationally. Uh, and at the same time, there are a number of figures, artists, architects, and so on, and other figures who, yeah, are relocating to Ghana. And this is the same thing happening in a number of different places. I, I sort of hesitate slightly at the notion that Africa is the single answer to any of these things, because again, I'm slightly hesitant about, I suppose, it's kind of binaries, uh, potentially between a corrupt West and a kind of pure Africa, potentially binaries that locate Africa as a font of truth knowledge authentic just kind of, just kind of spiritual recuperation some of these things i guess uh, i'm interested rather in africa as a place that's as complicated as contradictory as rich and strange as every other part of the world i don't look to africa for an answer or I would suggest we don't look to Africa for an answer. I would suggest we look to Africa and its countries and people for more questions, for yet further ways of looking, for yet further points of inspiration. Yes, points of connection, points of kinship, all of these things, but not as a singular point of return, because a notion of return for me, I think has, at least in some way, some implicit notion of going back, going back, not just geographically, but potentially historically, as if we arrive back at a point of underdevelopment. So I want to resist an idea of an origin point, because it suggests, again, dichotomy between origin and uh, evolution beyond origin in the West. I want to rather think about Africa, as I think it is anyway, as a place that has always been cosmopolitan, always been hybrid, always been complex, always been contradictory. And in there, we find yet more possibilities for expression and connection. So I might try to sneak in one last question, if that's OK, um, in our final moments. And this builds off a question that one of the students in my uh, uh, in my class has asked about the connection between um, the Black Fantastic and contemporary mass media. Um, and, and I was thinking sim kind of similarly about, um, you know, you've already mentioned one of them, films like Black Panther, kind of forever, um, but also a film like Jordan Peele's Nope, um, uh, but also Mati Diop's Atlantics, um, extraordinary film. I'm just wondering when you are watching contemporary media and contemporary popular culture continue to unfold, um, uh, you know, in real time. Um, are you seeing the Black Fantastic being rewritten and rethought um, with, with, with each new production? Or, or, or is there a kind of um, limit to the genealogy, if you will? Well, I, I mean, I, look, I guess I'm, uh, I wanted to propose an idea that 
was capacious was capacious enough to hold and to honor what I could see happening in the cultural production of black creative figures and unfolding ambition towards these things we've talked about you know, myth speculative fiction and so on deliberately drawing on those as a way to create more space to think and return and scrutinize the everyday to do both of these things simultaneously uh, to that extent i'm not looking to put parameters around the black fantastic but also i like to think of myself not as the sole or singular custodian of what is or isn't yeah. within this territory so it's as interesting for me to see your work and to think about well does this can we legitimately make a connection here with all these other things that we're talking about so far in terms of all those examples that, that you just suggested there well we're kind of forever and open so i say yes we we see those that's what's exciting but Equally, I'm entirely happy for someone to say, no, that doesn't fit within that because of this and that. That's as it should be. So I guess what I look forward to is a continued exploration of this territory, continued fashioning of a lattice of connections and associations. We'll see if it has a limit. Echo, that was also a, a subtle plug to the universe as a way of making sure you get multiple editions, multiple printings of your book, and, and hopefully many more runs of the exhibition that can keep expanding um, as it goes. What an um, honor and treat for me to be in conversation with you. Thank you so much for your work uh, and for your time with us. Uh, it's just been a real, a real joy. So I want to thank you. I want to thank the Center on Public Diplomacy. Um, and I want to thank everybody who has taken time out of their day to join us uh, and be a part of these conversations. Echo, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Josh, and thank you to Jay, and thank you to Cesar. It's been a, such a pleasure to, to, you know, expect, to share this short map time with you yeah. today. Thank you. Hope, thank you. Hopefully there'll be more opportunities. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Goodbye, everybody. Mm -hmm.